Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube in our Palo Alto studios. We've got a great conversation lined up here. Ben Cena, CEO of DigiCert, back on the Cube for the second time with uh, your company, DigiCert. Thanks for coming back. John, it's always a pleasure to be on the Cube. I really enjoy our conversations here. We're going to have a great conversation. Your company is doing extremely well. Um, great traction. You're in that rarefied air on the growth strategy. Congratulations. I mean, security is obviously hot, cybersecurity, but you guys do something significantly different than everyone else. And also, huge customer base, big players, hyperscales and whatnot. Um, you guys have a great solution. Give us a quick update on what's going on with DigiCert, then I want to go into some of the quantum AI and IoT questions. Sure. Well, DigiCert, John, continues to be the global leader in digital trust. Uh, you know, over 80% of Fortune 500 are DigiCert customers. Uh, we, uh, we recently closed the biggest quarter in the company's history uh, in January. Uh, we've hired a new CFO, a new CMO, and a new CRO. And uh, we've charted a path to a billion dollars in annual recurring revenue. Uh, you're absolutely right. Digital yeah. trust is going through a huge renaissance, yeah. you know, and uh, we're smack in the center of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're innovating furiously. Last year, we filed 32 new patents. Uh, so the future is bright for DigiCert, and I'm excited to be here. You guys got a great team. Trust and reputation, one of the hottest parts of the conversation right now with the whole societal change and businesses are evolving with the AI wave, we're going to dig into it. But before we get started, let's give a quick recap of what do you guys do, what's the product, who are your customers, what is this, the core technology solution? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so DigiCert is, uh, as I said, a global leader in digital trust for the real world. And uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean, look around you, you know. Uh, how do you know that, uh, you know, you're talking to uh, the right website when you're transacting with your bank, right? How do you know that, uh, the, the update that you got on your iPhone is legitimate software from Apple, right? Uh, a medical device that you're wearing, you know, how can you guarantee that it's not been tampered with, right? Uh, maybe you signed a contract, you know, how will it hold up in a court of law? Right? Uh, all of these are essential digital trust problems and under the hood, there's cryptography, there's public key infrastructure that is uh, providing uh, that essential uh, trust and, uh, and, and the ability for businesses and individuals to have the confidence that all these interactions are going to be secure and trustworthy. Um, and it's, um, I often joke, it's kind of like plumbing in your house, right? Uh, you take it for granted till it, uh, it, it has a big leak and then it floods your basement and then all hell breaks loose. You've had an amazing career you, at Zscale from, from the early days. Obviously Zscale is continuing to do well there. I mean, they're going to be a rule of 80 companies soon. They're just doing extremely well. Again, that, that networking and that security paradigm, you know, was once a deep tech inside the ropes conversation. But now that we're seeing technology be so ubiquitous, it is hitting everyone in their daily lives. People with an iPhone, people have uh, electronic cars. Everything has software in it. So everything's right. kind of software defined. Right. We're seeing that the AI world, if software defined, um, devices or mechanisms are software defined. You can decouple any physical aspects. So we see in a whole nother generation of devices and things. Right. What are some examples that people could relate to if you could point to in, 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 in the world now that AI is enabling and the IoT world? What are some of the things that are, are, are going to be software enabled that need trust that yeah. people may not know? You mentioned uh, the iPhone. Okay, if everyone sees the updates, hmm, is that coming from, who's that coming from? Right, right. You know? Yeah, no, look. I mean, software is eating up the world, right? Um, if you look at AI, uh, probably the biggest trust challenge for our generation is going to be the ability to distinguish what is real and what's fake, right? I mean, the Washington Post had an article day before that talked about half of the world going to vote in 2024, and deep fakes are creating uh, a massive problem uh, for free and fair elections, right? So. With generative AI, how do I know that this is, uh, you know, this is real and this is fake? Uh, I mean, the cube will release a video. If someone sends it to me on WhatsApp, uh, how do I know that it's not been tampered with, right? So that's kind of a big trust problem. Um, in the world of software, I mean, devices, IoT, they're proliferating everywhere. Uh, you know, I might be, I might have a infusion pump, right? <laughs> how do I know that it's yeah. not been tampered with? Yeah. You know, is it running legitimate software? I mean, it's kind of here, trust is equal to life and death, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, one of my favorite problems these days is uh, what happens uh, if uh, uh, quantum computers uh, become a reality? I mean, it's, dis it's a massive race going on 
uh, in uh, developing stable quantum computers, and uh, it can be an extinction level event for many of the cryptographic protocols yeah. that uh, we take for granted in our day-to-day -day daily digital trust interactions. You know, there was a movie um, on the streaming, one of the streaming platforms where the Teslas get taken over by the hacker right. and right. just drive running everywhere. Right. So I mean, right. you can really, whoa, that's possible. <laughs> um, so people can start to see that if you have a device that's connected to the internet, if it's got you know, a processor on it, which pretty much they do, have probably an yeah. ARM processor, it could be taken over. So this is kind of where people start getting into the yeah. conspiracy theory, doomsday scenario, but it's possible. And that's the key thing. Quantum is interesting because people feel that quantum could be the technology that cracks the encryption. Yes. And that's one of the top conversations. Yep. There's some also conversation that there's some quantum advances that might stop that. Can you help us understand the, the, what's going on with quantum, quantum computing? Um, obviously, it's it's niche right now, and there's only a few use cases where it really will work. But what's 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 the outlook for quantum, and why should we be aware of the potential threat? Yeah, uh, I mean, look, uh, if you follow the news, there's a there's a huge arms race going on between Microsoft, Google. IBM, nation states to develop stable quantum computers. And why is that? Uh, it's because they unleash the kind of compute that uh, we just uh, don't have today. And they can solve problems such as climate modeling and maybe predicting the stock market and these very, very complex problems that current computers are infeasible um, at, uh, at today. So now, w what is the flip side, you know, as I say, uh, uh, every you know every every advance has a has a you know negative side to it. Uh, the flip side is it can also break modern cryptography. Now, modern cryptography it's based on problems that are very hard for traditional computers. So, for example, if I say, John, can you factorize a number like three hundred and twenty-three, right? And you'll you'll yeah, try, sure. <laughs> and you'll like you'll, maybe you'll spend some time and you'll come up with an answer. But if I tell you uh, one of the factors is 19, you can quickly divide 323 by 19 and get 17, yeah. right? So th the entire asymmetric cryptography is based on these types of problems yeah. where if you knew the answer, it's very quick. But if you don't, it will take an a, a, you know, unbelievable amount of time to brute force it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so that's essentially what's used in in algorithms like RSA and Diffie-Hellman. Yeah. And the fundamental cryptography problem is, I need to talk to you, right? Yeah. How do we exchange keys that will secure our communication? And it's based on these sort of one-way functions where if I, if I know one part of the answer, I can very easily guess the other part, otherwise I, I can't. Now, so what's the quantum problem? The quantum problem is, uh, if, I, if I give you a, thousand digit number and say factorize it, it might take thousands of years on current computers to do it. However, a quantum computer process, you know, has these spooky properties like superposition and entanglement and you know, these are all you know, very non-intuitive properties and essentially it allows these quantum computers to exist in multiple parallel states. And the net effect is a problem like factorizing big prime numbers that would take thousands of years on the fastest computer today can be solved in minutes yeah. on a quantum computer. Yeah. So, Which means that the private key, which is the key element of can key be, exchange, can, can be, be easily guessed. And then right? that could be a man in the middle attack. That could or be it could be anything, yeah. right? Now, the, the question is, well, quantum computers have been around for a while. Why this, you know, what's, what's new and urgent now? It is true, you know, the, there's a the famous uh, computer scientist called Peter Shor at MIT, and he invented the Shor algorithm yeah. to break this type of cryptography, but we didn't have access to stable computers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read some of the recent announcements by Microsoft, they've introduced what is called error correction. And what error correction does is, you know, it's 800 times better than what was before. Yeah. And now you have the ability to have stable quantum computers and the rate at which things are advancing, it's only a matter of time uh, when, you know, you, uh, when you have a kind of an extinction level event mm -hmm. for modern cryptography, yeah, yeah. right? So many people call it Q day, right? Quantum day. Uh, and there's a, there's a day before quantum and a day after quantum. You know, I, I noticed in your career you had a, an R&D background. There's a lot of R&D going on in quantum. Is there any kind of signs of um, movement relative to the quantum advancements outside of 
use cases because we're seeing what we've been reporting on the cube is you know like um, 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 biology areas you know yeah. you're seeing some real good use cases but not yet mainstream yeah what's the r d that what are companies doing from an r d standpoint right now that to be ready for quantum what can they do um, i know a lot of people are putting on their agenda is there r d going on and if so what should companies be thinking about yeah absolutely look uh, i mean obviously the people who are behind creating quantum computers are doing all kinds of interesting things like you know, better error correction to just get to stable quantum computers, right? Um, but then uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of work happening in cryptography, uh, what is called post-quantum cryptography. How do we prepare a uh, new set of math problems that even quantum computers cannot solve, right? So NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology has been at it for a decade. And what's interesting is last year they released four algorithms, right? And you know you might have heard fancy names like dilithium and falcon and and sphinx and yeah. and kyber and yeah. and essentially these are quantum safe algorithms that allow uh, people to exchange keys and sign documents and software uh, that even quantum computers cannot tamper with. Um, so what's what's happening there is you know this year, sometime late in fall, but definitely by the end of the year. These, these would be available as FIPS standards. And so uh, you have post-quantum cryptography that is standardized, and so what's left is uh, organizations having the ability to, to quickly react and, and update to these uh, more modern uh, quantum ciphers. In fact, Digicert, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have launched the first International Quantum Readiness Day. It's uh, September 26, 2024. Um, to, you know, again, rally organizations, drive that sense of urgency that uh, people need to start thinking about preparing for post-quantum cryptography. So you guys came up with that date. So it's kind of like Earth Day just happened. This is kind of like, like that, like quantum right? day. So this has been brewing for some time, <laughs> but uh, the time to act is now, and, and we want to drive that urgency. In fact, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the, Wash uh, the, the uh, President Biden came up with uh, a memorandum last year yeah. Uh, that is uh, directing all federal government agencies to uh, adopt uh, post-quantum cryptography as soon as possible. You might be, you know, be surprised to know that you know your iMessage or WhatsApp messaging is already switched over to uh, uh, quantum cryptography. So people are thinking about it, but enterprises generally have been very, very slow uh, to adopt and react. Are those messages encrypted? iMessage. Uh, so iMessage, Signal Protocol, WhatsApp messages, they're all starting to encrypt that initial key exchange that I talked about using a uh, quantum safe algorithm, um, which is great. In fact, Cloudflare published a blog talking about how almost 25% of the traffic that is coming to them is now using quantum safe key exchange. Over the internet- What does that mean, quantum safe? So uh, it's using of one of these algorithms that NIST is it has been talking about. In the post-quantum right. post um, cryptography world. Correct, correct. So, so th these standards are in the works and we expect them to be fully yeah, baked yeah. by the end of the year, but people are not waiting because yeah. uh, there, there is this worry about harvest now and decrypt later attack, right? Yeah. Like WhatsApp, their claim to fame was end-to-end -end encryption, right? When I send you a message, John, nobody like in, yeah. can sniff it. But what harvest now and decrypt later does is someone can capture those packets and save it and wait for a quantum computer to arrive and then decrypt it, right? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, so some of these messaging protocols are saying, hey, it's better, better to be proactive and change those uh, algorithms. So the harvesting is a tactic for this quote, Q day that you've been mentioning. Correct. That's what everyone's afraid of, this quantum day. Correct. Like, Correct. It's like so, zero day, quantum day. Kind yeah, of like when stable quantum computers are available, will I be able to use all the packets that I've captured and, and decrypt them? The answer is yes, unless all of those start adopting quantum safe cryptography, which is in the works as we speak. So all my messages are harvested you know, somewhere. You know, I'm exposed, <laughs> well, go back to <laughs> Well, you know, people ask me that, I, I say my messages are not that important, so, <laughs> but I'm sure there are other people whose messages are very important. Real quick, I want to just get the stats on this readiness day. So September 26th, Quantum readiness day. What does that mean? What should people do? What is that? What's what's that day going to celebrate? We're going to get up and do some quantum calculations. Oh, what, what's going to happen <laughs> on that day? Tell us. It, it's a great question. Look, yeah. we also did a survey, <laughs> uh, John, of about 1,400 uh, security 
leaders across the globe yeah. and found that 61% of organizations are absolutely not prepared, yeah. right, uh, for post-quantum cryptography. And, and if you talk to uh, experts, and in fact, you know, one of the things we've done is we've launched a, a quantum advisor program yeah. where our experts are talking to a lot of these organizations in an effort to get them prepared, to guide them through steps of, hey, step one, do this, step two, do this. And what are those steps? It's very basic. Yeah. Step one, do an inventory of all the cryptography within your organization. <laughs> I mean, at least have a sense yeah, yeah. of what's out there. How many servers are using what kind of ciphers, right? What software libraries are using vulnerable cryptography? Yeah. So step one, inventory. Step two is what we call crypto agility, right? The ability to quickly swap out a, a vulnerable digital certificate, a vulnerable uh, crypto library that uh, is, uh, is, is, yeah. is not safe, right? So um, what's gonna happen on quantum day is first, now we are educating a lot of organizations to, to, to prepare for crypto agility. Uh, it's, it's kind of like an awareness day. We're gonna put we're on the cube calendar. We will celebrate, we'll come up with some props. I would love that. We'll put, <laughs> maybe an outfit, maybe a color, a hat or something. We'll do something. <laughs> kind of like St. Patrick's Day, we'll do some, we'll have, you know, have, we'll have a celebration. Yeah. All right, so I got to get back to the AI conversation because okay. again, another wave that here's AI. Obviously, qu post uh, crypt um, quantum cryptography is now the standard. We see that evolution. We'll we'll keep promoting that for you guys. It, it's the world we got to get to. But AI is here now. Yep. You mentioned deep fakes. Um, the cube actually it's actually a great deep fake uh, set of data because it's two talking heads and talking yeah. heads, and so yeah. easy to get that audio. Um, but there's also bigger implications. There's no yet seal of approval. There's no like you know, uh, ingredient stamp that says, hey, FDA approved, Cube approved video. So we're going to get there soon. I think we're going to have that soon, moment sooner than later. Someone, it might be DigiCert. You guys yeah. might be the, the seal of approval for what's yeah. real and what's not. What's going on in AI that you guys are watching very closely that maybe wasn't on your radar uh, pre-Gen AI? Because generative AI is a new thing. Right. In the sense, it's generating right. content, right. generating things versus a programmable world. Yeah. No, so uh, I'll, uh, again, I'll go back to the trust problem is what's real, what's fake. And that manifests itself in multiple forms, right? Um, when you have content, I want to know, is this authentic content from the Cube or from the New York Times, right? Um, when I have, uh, you know, uh, I was watching a Law and Order episode and I was joking with my wife that one, there will be a, a, a scenario where the jurors are sitting and discussing, was that crime scene video that we saw doctored, right? What's the what is the authenticity of, of, you know, what's the chain of custody digitally for that uh, piece of content, right? So there's a real and fake problem, but there's also the other classes of problem where, um, you know, phishing, for example, right, can be very effective. Yeah. If I get a voice call that mimics the CEO asking someone in the finance department to wire money, that's a huge problem. I mean, it's very hard to refute that. Yeah. So uh, new classes of phishing, yeah. you know, Content authenticity, content origination, these are all uh, very important problems. And DigiCert's actively involved with uh, media, uh, media companies, with technology companies like Microsoft, like Adobe, Sony. Uh, we're talking to camera manufacturers. Let me give you a simple scenario of sort of overall end-to-end -end content authenticity. You know, you take out your phone today and you take a picture, right? Uh, the picture has metadata, it has, you know, location, time, camera type, camera all, type yeah. all of that. What's the problem? The problem is anyone can go and edit that, right? Uh, you take that picture, you download it on your laptop, you use Adobe Photoshop, edit it, you send it to yeah. someone else, they edit it, and what the end user is consuming, along with other generative AI stuff on top of it, has lost its source authenticity, yeah. right? So what we're, uh, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're working on standards called uh, content authenticity standards, and it's an industry-wide effort where in that scenario, what's going to happen is the camera manufacturer is going to sign the metadata so that it's tamper-proof. Kind of like how you sign digital yeah. documents. Yeah, yeah. Like when you sign a digital document, I can see the, the entire sequence, who signed it, and I know for a fact that this PDF has not, cannot be altered. Yeah. It's secured by it's the a same... digital content bill of materials. Exactly. It's, it's, it's secured by the same cryptography <laughs> that we were discussing. Yeah. How do we bring that into this whole media content provenance, right? Yeah. All the way from creation of the media to you applied some changes, some filters, some AI tools. I want a full manifest of those changes signed, right? Yeah. And then, you know, if, if you publish it on the cube, 
I want the cube's digital signature to be on it, right? So if someone is consuming it, they know for a fact that, you know, this is uh, not being altered in any way. Uh, well, I mean, we got a new business source. line, we call it CubeCert. CubeCert, we will be happy to provide that because, to you. I mean, because if you think about, I mean, I mean I'm just joking, but that's legit. Uh, potential scenario. If you look at software supply chain right now, yep. you're seeing the same thing play out in software. Absolutely. Where did that software come from? Open source, was it doctored? So origination is a huge point. The camera metadata right. at the point of origination, that's the beginning of the lineage or chain of command, if you yeah. will. How do you guys look at that and how should the industry be looking at it? Because it's going to be, it's going to put probably more opportunity for you guys to, to go after those opportunities. But What's going to change for companies like ours and others? Because they have to start thinking, okay, every piece of data is potentially now going to be in a supply chain for some workflow. Yeah. And with AI, workflows and data is the new intellectual property. Right. So if it's not secured, right. yeah, then no. it's going to be all hell breaks loose. Yeah, look, a lot of our progressive customers, John, uh, are using uh, DigiCert's Trust Lifecycle Manager. And what is that? It is. It is the platform that automates discovery, you know, governance, and then sort of automation of all these little trust elements that we talked about, right? So step one, when you have, uh, uh, when you have DigiCert One's Trust Lifecycle Manager, all cryptography within your organization, right, is centrally available, right? Uh, it could be literally, you know, millions of digital certificates that are on all your cloud workloads, embedded in your software development cycle, all of that gets centralized, mm -hmm. right? Back to your software supply chain. Now, once you have that, you first need to know who the hell is authorized yeah. to release uh, sanctioned software, right? And um, it, it's, it boils down to two simple steps. First, you need to inspect the software supply chain and make sure that it doesn't have malware in it. And number two, when you release it for consumption, you need to yeah. sign it with, in you know, the, this is the Cube software or the Cube's yeah. video, right? Yeah. And once you do that, it becomes tamper resistant. Nobody can change it, nobody can alter it. And back to your sort of software bill of materials, it's kind of like the FDA uh, label on an organic food stamp, right? Like as a consumer, yeah. I pick up a salad and it says organic, and there's a certain inherent level of trust because I know that someone has inspected yeah. it and what went inside is, is higher quality, right? I can turn it around and look at the ingredients and the ingredients will tell me exactly what went into it. Yeah. The same is true for software. And in fact, um, you know, the, uh, if you look at the, and we'll talk about IoT, but this is a huge problem in IoT because uh, you know, you're getting all these over the air updates and you know, who's, who's telling me that you know, this does, is not laced with some yeah. new AI malware or yeah. you know, some library that's been completely broken and allows a backdoor yeah. into, into- Or behind. data fusion where you have data sets interacting large language models or foundation models interacting with each other. Correct. That's a potential surface area for computing on the AI side. So it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the label, the, it's like an ingredient label, it's got X number of calories and yeah. grams of fat kind of thing into it, I see that. I'm seeing a lot, and this is kind of a little bit off topic, but I just want to get your thoughts while you're here. There's a lot of ethical AI conversations, certainly at the government level, and we're going to have trust. But it's coming at it from a policy standpoint. Is that the cart before the horse? Because if you don't have the, like the, the technology conversation happening here, if you force the narrative, I need to see the label of AI, and the cert or the supply chain is not there, there's kind of a mismatch here. You're kind of forcing, you know, setting the agenda yeah. before the agenda could be set. There's no technology. So, I mean, it's a trade-off. On one hand, you want the technology to get going, as Andy Grove used to say, let chaos reign and reign in the chaos, right. uh, which is a very famous line in the tech industry. Yet you got you know progressives and 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 uh, social justice warriors saying, hey, you know, push push yeah, the I, AI ethical. I look, I mean, you're right. The 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 rate of change in AI is so fast that policy is talking about problems here, and while they are discussing problems, you know, the <laughs> technology has moved here, right? Yeah. So in many ways. Uh, you you almost need AI to govern AI, right? <laughs> so you know you need you need a LLM that can in you know in the in the example you were talking about you produce a data bill of materials, right? Produce a uh, a list of libraries, kind of you know ingredients. What went into it, yeah. right? What was the training set? Was it sanctioned, right? Who's released it? Uh, to make sure that yeah. open source models are not getting laced with things that I, didn't, I, I don't know. I want to know where all of this came from, right? 
Now the challenge is how do I distill all of that into a simple label, yeah. you know, like organic, right? Yeah. And and that's yeah. that's the hard part. But I think, um, you know, it's good to have policy yeah, it's, discussions. It's, not, it's but, evolving. But it's, you need you need uh, AI tools to yeah. govern AI tools. I mean, we've been riffing on the cube. I don't want to waste time here doing it, but we've been riffing on the cube around this notion of a compiler-like environment right. for these LLMs because right. you want to make sure yeah. that they're authentic. So, like, what does that? Who even does that? Like, what does that even mean? Uh, but it brings up a good point around like, okay, if if you have the trust, you got to have the technology. And again, the, you, it's moving very fast. Now, IoT is, yeah. is our last topic area uh, because this plays directly to both new, right. faster devices and the paradigm shift of how data is managed. So you have uh, the edge or right. IoT devices emerging that have essentially multi-threaded processors on them, memory, okay. smaller, faster, cheaper. Yeah. Smarter. I think, look, the, the, my, the problem Great environment to enable new things, yeah. but at the same time, increases potential. The massive attack surface yeah. is, is, the, is the way I look at it with the cybersecurity <laughs> lens. I mean, here's the problem. There'll be 75 billion IoT devices by end of next year. 10 times more than humans, right? Yeah. I mean, just look around your house. How many IoT devices do you have? And you know, how do you expect a two, $300 device to, to be robust, reliable, trustworthy, right? Yeah. Now, if you look at your phone, your iPhone, your Android phone, uh, where does it get its core yeah. security from? I mean, the phone has a trusted chip from Apple, right? And so you can't tamper with that uh, device. And the software updates that you get are signed by Apple, so you have a trusted device getting trusted yeah. software to the extent it's possible. Mm -hmm. How do I make that happen in an IoT? It's kind of the IoT trust problem. And, you know, um, Digicert, for example, uh, is, uh, is now deployed across a billion televisions in Europe, right? So all the televisions that are being manufactured get their birth certificate, yeah. you know, uh, from, yeah. from Digicert. Um, similarly, you know, a lot of medical device manufacturers where trust is equal to life and death, uh, they are using similar mechanisms to say, this is a trusted device and only trusted software issued by me will run on it, right? And uh, whether it's glucose monitors or infusion pumps, you know, they're all kind of yeah. adopting those mechanisms. Um, recently, uh, you know, we've started working with EV uh, uh, manufacturers, right? Like when you take your uh, car, electric car, and plug it to a charge network, you know, how does the car authenticate itself? How does the network know to build John, right? Yeah. All of these are based on- Or is it an authentic device? Is it an authentic device? Am I even, should I even allow it to charge, right? Yeah. So, you know, Digicert's the first unaffiliated route of trust yeah. for uh, the US plug and charged uh, uh, standard. So whether it's uh, Matter, where again, we were the first route of trust for interoperable devices uh, within, within your home or EV charging, uh, they all start with those two basic things. Yeah. I need a trusted device, which has a tamper-proof identity, and I need trusted software. And uh, what, uh, what Digicert One, the platform does, is it allows IoT manufacturers to embed these types of birth certificates in their manufacturing lines. It allows them to inspect their software, sign it, right? And then make sure that whether it's over-the-air updates or you know, programming in the factory, they get authentic updates. You know? Now, I was surprised that uh, in like, you know, we just recently announced a partnership with Panasonic. Uh, all air conditioners in India, right, that Panasonic is, ma is making, uh, will have uh, trusted identities coming from, uh, from Digicert. Yeah, make sure that grid is completely wired up. I mean, you're so passionate about the, uh, the Digicert and the trusted environment. Um, how could you not be excited? This technology, you have a great business model, and also the change in the market and society all factoring in as the nexus of your opportunity. Um, and all the things that we're talking about beg the question, what do you optimize for? And, and this is rhetorical to you, to you and the market, which is, okay, the way I did things before, whether it's observability, managing 72 billion signals then, and getting more, it'll be hundreds of billions of signals on observability. You got data, old data warehousing, data cloud techniques, data lakes. You know, how do you get that latency? You got quantum, you got AI. Do we have to rethink everything? Or is the script flipping? Yeah. And that's the, I guess my final question is, things have to change, and what do you optimize for if you're a company? That's a great question, and I, I'd say, you know, in today's world, digital trust is, is, is tantamount for doing any business, right? Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, lot of studies that have shown that when your customers trust you, yeah. 
it's, it's, it's better for business, it's better for growth, it's yeah. better for everything. But you're right, you know, as an organization, I'm bombarded with many things and prioritization becomes an important topic, right? Um, fortunately, what's happening is with things like quantum and AI, many people are understanding the importance of modernizing their PKI infrastructure because this is kind of that plumbing, yeah. the, the, the digital trust glue that brings it all together, right? And, um, and I would urge, uh, you know, CISOs and CIOs and just product security leaders to start thinking about modernizing this trust infrastructure because it is great for their business. It establishes long-term growth mm -hmm. uh, because trust with your customers is, is something that you, uh, they say you earn in drops, yeah. but you lose in buckets, right? Yeah. So um, I would optimize for that. It's trust, it's, it's also um, functionality, operational with now devices, yeah. you mentioned IoT. Yeah. It's interesting, trust networks, trust technology and networking have always been like the, the, <laughs> the key areas in all business, because no, that's a central part of the technology that's going to enable yeah. Gen AI and all these new capabilities that's around the corner. Yeah. I mean, thanks for coming on theCUBE, thanks for sharing, and congratulations on your business success, and again, technology, business model, and markets all hot for you guys, you guys are the center of the action. Thank you, John. Uh, always a pleasure yeah. to be uh, on theCUBE and uh, I really enjoyed our uh, scintillating conversation. And <laughs> yeah, we'll get that CUBE certification soon so with no deep fakes. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE. Thanks for watching theCUBE here in Palo Alto. Thanks for watching.